Can you show that in here? Right here? Sure. The magazine? My name's Bliss. Bliss too. B L I S S T E W. Nice to meet you. So since we sold out on the magazine, we got reprinted articles. Okay. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. This is our commander, Bill. Okay. Bill, he does some of the magazines and helps publish some of the information.
any of the speakers or our ability to use this building in the future because we just want to say whatever we want. So thank you for understanding that. We really do appreciate you for coming. All right, a few items that uh, you might like to know. Uh, first of all, the restrooms are down in the foyer down at the bottom of the stairs past the desk. There are also a couple of rest restrooms upstairs if you take the stairs up to your left. Uh, they're on the right as you come in or the left as you leave this, this uh, room. There's an emergency exit to that side and up here. We would like you to please silence your uh, as Tom affectionately calls them, your NSA tracking device, please turn it all the way down. And I've, I've had a woman point out to me that some people are affected by uh, wireless signals. If you wouldn't mind and you're not going to use your cell phone, since we're turning them down, turn it on to airplane mode and, and you won't be affecting your neighbor with any extra radiation. Sort of a popular idea, thank you. You never know. All right. I've got a couple of other announcements. Um, if you are interested in being, beginning to, or already have been attending your city, county, or uh, your city or county planning commission meetings, and or your city or council or Utah county commissions, Utah county commissioner meetings, in Utah County, it's a mouthful. And if you would like to learn and share with others your experiences regarding the UN Agenda 21 planning and zoning in your community, and if you have had a desire to work consistently and positively to identify and resist UN Agenda 21 property confiscation, social engineering tactics occurring in your community, then please consider attending the first UN-Agenda 21 or UN Agenda 21. It's in all caps. I don't know whether it's an UNAgenda 21. Where's Larry? Is it UNAgenda 21 or UN Agenda 21? UN. UN, okay. Please consider attending the first UN Agenda 21 in Utah County Meetup Group Friday, April 8th, that's next week at 7 p.m. at the home of Larry Ballard in Salem. See Larry after this meeting for details and a map. Larry, please stand up and thank you, Larry, for your efforts on this topic. Also, all of you can find out about the basics of UN Agenda 21 planning and zoning by visiting the webpage Agenda 21, that's the numbers 21, Agenda 21 in Utah County .com. Agenda 21 in UtahCounty.com. All right, thank you, Larry Ballard, for uh, making that effort. Another announcement of related interest. Um, the residents of Utah County may have the opportunity to have a constitutional candidate run for the office of sheriff. We have a man in the audience named, hold on a second, we have a man in the audience named Andrew Curtis. Andrew, are you here? Please stand up. Thank you. It sounds like many of you already know Andrew. I don't personally know him, but uh, I'm all for people finding out more information. He's a former law enforcement officer from Florida, in Florida and Idaho. I'm not sure exactly where he's from. Where are you from, Andrew? I'm from Idaho. From Idaho. He is willing to run for sheriff of Utah County if he has the support of enough Utah County residents. And he will be speaking Friday, April 8th at the Sarah Theater in Orem at 7 p.m. That's on 745 State Road, room 201. That's Friday, April 8th at the Sarah Theater in Orem at 7 p.m. That's 745 South on State Street, room 201. Now, for more information, please go to Facebook and look up Andrew Curtis for Utah County Sheriff, or he's here tonight, you can talk to him. So, if you're really politically active or uh, 
active on these topics, you're going to have to make a decision between Larry Ballard and Andrew Curtis. Well, he's hosting on the same night at the same time a UN Agenda 21 planning and zoning meeting. Did I get that right? So if you'll note the conflict, he is not running for sheriff, but he is hosting a meeting. Please support whoever you can. He has good causes right there, Richard. All right. At the meeting, I guess I should add it, at the meeting for Andrew Curtis, he will be speaking for about 15 minutes and then we'll be doing question and answer, so it won't be a long meeting. All right. Uh, we uh, have a couple of uh, giveaways. We actually have three giveaways tonight. We usually do a giveaway. Hey, Lowell. is uh, a copy of The Constitution, A Heavenly Banner by Ezra Taft Benson. It's a short book, donated kindly by uh, Kurt Crosby, who always comes out and promotes liberty through his materials and the Liberty Roundtable. If you have a ticket ending 8987, you are the winner of The Constitution, A Heavenly Banner. 8987. Jesus. 
Thank you, Lord. Um, that can be found in numerous places in Scripture. You can go search for that and you will find it. The second one is 2 Nephi chapter 9, verse, 20, verse 41, which reads, that the keeper of the gate is the Holy One of Israel, and he employeth no servant there. And to the wise and the learned and the rich, he will not open up unless they consider themselves fools for a while and humble themselves before him. Well, if there are any that ought to consider themselves wise, learned, and rich, those of us living in America, in Utah Valley even, in this time of what appears to be relative peace, could, could humble ourselves and and consider that thought that uh, we need to humble ourselves and uh, remember that He is the keeper of the gate and that it is our relationship with Him that matters the absolute most. With that, I'm going to go ahead and say a prayer and then I'm going to turn the time over to uh, Sherilyn and uh, Sherilyn Eager. Everyone knows everyone here, don't we? We can dispense with last names. I'm going to go ahead and uh, turn the time over to her, and then we'll get started. And we're, we apologize, we're a little bit disorganized. We do have uh, some of these administrative hassles, like gag order, uh, other, other weird things going on related to this event, uh, to, the, to the events of Oregon, and uh, the idea of getting truth out. And uh, we do appreciate that, that everyone has come tonight, and we have everyone here, so we can at least have, have some interaction. With that, I'll say a prayer. Our Father in Heaven, we are so grateful that we can be here tonight. We're so thankful for our Savior Jesus and His sacrifice for us. And we're thankful to be in the world at this time. We're thankful that You have given us the many, many blessings that we have. We're thankful for the Scriptures and for good men and women who teach us. We're grateful for the ethos of America and the principles upon which it was founded of liberty and righteous living and devotion to you. We pray, God, that tonight we will have a spirit of peace in our hearts. Bless us that our interaction will be godly. Bless us that we will be at peace one with another. Please enlighten us as to what you want us to do relative to our circumstances in the world at this time. We thank you again for the incredible bounty with which we have been blessed and for our Savior and the light you have given us. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. Sherilyn Eager. <clears throat> First of all, I want to thank Dan and Thomas for having the courage to stand for truth. And I'd like to know how many of you listen to the Liberty Lineup radio show on k -Talk. All right, not enough. So, how many of you don't? All those that did, raise your hand. We are on the air on uh, Monday through Friday, 10 a.m. to noon on AM 6.30. And you can also, if you have one of these smartphones, you can download the app on your smartphone and wherever, wherever there's internet, you can hear us out and clear all over the world. And also on k-talk.com online. And I want to thank all of you who've been so very supportive. You know, uh, we have some of our other hosts, I think, that are here with us this evening. I saw Chris, Chris Kimball. Where are you? Chris, wave your hand. There she is, right there, that beautiful lady. And she has um, announced that she is running for State Senate. And, and she is the candidate. Um, what? Oh, I'm sorry, I upgraded you. All right, House. And, and she is the nominee for the Republican Party because she has no um, opponent. So, uh, but I have been asked Am I really doing too loud on this? I'd much rather be singing. <laughs> All right. Um, 
Dan has asked me to give a little bit of a background and to moderate for the speakers this evening, and I will uh, handle the Q&A as well. But um, on our radio show, we are very determined to bring our audience the truth. I learned very early on in my activism, when I was on the front lines for different issues, that when I read the paper the next day, I didn't recognize the event that I had been at, nor the people who were there with me. And this is getting increasingly a problem in the media. And the people that you are going to be hearing this evening are people who are going to be telling you the other side of the story that you're not hearing. And this has been, uh, if you had asked me at Christmas time, if uh, at the first of the year, I was going to spend the first quarter of the year becoming communications and media relations for a man who was going to be shot and killed on a lonely, snowy highway in Oregon because he was standing up for the Constitution, I would have told you that would be highly unlikely and impossible. But here we are, we're in a time where when we're speaking about true principles, more and more, the further away that the world moves from those correct principles, the more we are looking like we are not normal. Okay, so I very gladly wear my tinfoil hat frequently at the radio station, and very proudly so. On January 1st, somewhere around January 1st, January 2nd, I read an article online about a rally that had been held in Burns, Oregon, and I knew some of the people that whose names were there, Bundy's, of course, and then Sheriff Mack, who you've heard before here, and I was very interested in what they were doing, and I read about the Hammonds, the ranchers up in Oregon, who had been sent to prison on a second term for the same crime, which is called double jeopardy. That caught my attention that this was happening to ranchers up in Oregon. And I knew that, the, of course, the land issue has been very big here in Utah and all throughout the Western states. So the next thing I learned is that some of them had gone over to a refuge, and from what the news was telling me, they had broken in and armed takeover of this refuge. And it sounded pretty extreme and violent to me. So I stayed up for 72 hours straight because I had to go on the air on Tuesday and I needed to know the facts. And I scoured the internet and I didn't sleep and I um, found myself in the middle of this saga that was unfolding and I had several days of no sleep, of, you know, just a few hours of sleep and then a day of no sleep for three days. And that's the way it went for the whole time they were up at the refuge. And we were able to make contact with some of the people inside the refuge. We interviewed LaVoy Finnecombe several times, his daughter Tara, who you're going to meet here this evening, and also the fire chief, if you, how many of you have been following this story? Because I don't want, okay. So the fire chief, Chris Bryles, uh, who had resigned his position after 30 years in that county because he caught some guys posing as militia, looking really scary, and scaring the townspeople, but they were FBI. And so this is the story that you are going to hear, and I want to, share uh, with you that the day that LaVoy Fennecombe was shot and killed, he was texting me and we had just met with some ranchers in Cedar City that had signed what we call divorce papers with the BLM and that went all across the internet. LaVoy heard about that and I think Jeanette, you were with him and we understand that he was absolutely thrilled to know that something good was coming of what they were doing and that this was building and the movement was building. And so uh, it was just a, a few hours when I got the last text from him because Janelle Tobias, who you might know, was going to 
go with me up to the refuge and we were going to go to the John Day event that they were all headed to when they were ambushed. And so I'm here today to tell this story. I don't know what might have come of me. I might be under a gag order along with you, Sean. But we wanted to get first eyewitness news for this radio. And Jan Lee and I are planning to go up to Oregon this coming week. And so watch for the news and see what's going to happen. But the, um, the experience, the long term, day-to-day -day experience that I had getting to know who LaVoy was, and then after he was shot and killed, going down to Kanab and meeting with the family, and we spent from 8 p.m. until about 2.30 a.m., and every single one of the family members sat around and shared their thoughts and feelings with me because I was going to be helping them with media at the funeral, and it was like paparazzi, really. There were 30, 40 cameras, everybody swarming, and this is a wonderful family, so I'm going to tell you a little bit about Shauna Cox here. Shauna, as you know, is a, a, she's the blonde lady over there. And, yes. uh, Shauna is going to tell you what they were doing and what they were teaching the people. This is what the news is not reporting. And, she'll probably tell you how militant and violent you all were, right? <laughs> she looks so violent, doesn't she? Uh, and so she is going to begin, but she, as you probably know, is the one that was in the ambush with the camera inside the truck. And for whatever reason, which we do not know yet, hers is the only video beside the aerial. Okay? It's a law in Oregon that you have to have a body cam if you're police. And so far, we know of no body cams, right? So she's going to share her eyewitness experience, and her video is at the center of this investigation that is going on right now. So um, she lives in Kanab, and she has a wonderful family, and I admire her for her courage and her strength. And then after, after uh, Shauna is finished, then uh, what order do you want to go? Jeanette is Lloyd Finnecombe's wife, and she is going to give you a glimpse of who Lloyd Finnecombe was. And I just have to tell you that these are two very, very wonderful people. You can't find two finer people in this world. They have, a, they have raised 11 children, and they are on a ranch at the border of Arizona and Utah on the Arizona side. And they were one of two families in Arizona that were given a special permit to take in and foster care adolescent boys at a very high risk level. And they are that kind of people. They are marvelous. And I have been so blessed to know Jeanette. And Tara is the oldest daughter. And then she is going to talk to you about her impressions of what happened who her father was and what she is doing about it now. And so we'll go in that order. And if you have questions, I'm going to be the last, Sherilyn. I'm going to go last. Oh, sorry. Okay, we're reversing the order. <laughs> okay. How many of you? How many of you saw the 12-minute aerial of? This okay. I should have asked how many have it. <laughs> with sound. How many have seen it? This, oh, this is with this is with uh, Shauna's video camera from inside. You haven't seen that. Okay, you need to see this. And then she's going to speak to the truth and error that she sees. Thank you. 
were both in our early 30s, 33, at a church dance, and um, he uh, was the package deal, is what I always say, because he had six of those kids already, and I had three, and then we had our sweet little TM, and then we adopted Mitch. We also became foster care parents along the way, 18 years of taking in um, teenage boys uh, who had a great deal of uh, difficulty in their life and needed a steady place to be and a male role model to help teach them who they should become. And that was the boy. And he was able to love them as if they were his. He was able to emulate and model um, what a, a good man should be like, behave, how they would treat their wives and children and siblings. Because it was so important for these boys to see that in a family setting because they didn't have that setting of their own. And um, we had over 60 boys in our home throughout the years. Um, my husband came from a ranch, ranching family, and I'm an army brat. I lived everywhere. And um, so we often refer to us as the East meeting the West. And I'm Miss Kitty and he's Matt Dillon. Some of the jokes we always uh, talked about. Uh, but he always dreamed of having a ranch of his own, like his father and his grandfather. And so we spent many years working and saving and then finally had the ability to move home and was able to purchase our own ranch. And we took the boys with us and they learned about hard work. <laughs> and uh, they just loved the outdoors and learning to um, explore and uh, create in their minds what normal kids do. Um, In the last seven or so years, my husband <clears throat> began to do a lot of reading. Uh, there's probably still about 10 books sitting under his chair, all the different things he was currently involved in. And uh, he just knew that there was something not quite right. And he started reading from all materials, both sides of the issues so that he could understand uh, the opposite point of view. And <clears throat> I was still busy with the kids. I did not do the reading he did. I have a lot of catch-up work to do. But in the reading, he discovered that he was not being true to himself or to what he felt the Constitution stood for. He felt that he was talking out of two sides of his mouth by signing on the line a lease with the BLM. And so he decided that he was going to fire them and request that he no longer needed their services by not signing the lease. And he did that without really telling me that day that he was going to do that. <laughs> I already knew what was in his mind and where he was going, but I didn't know he was going to be on Brian Hyde's show. <laughs> he was just too little long in his truck and felt that that's where he wanted to go. He didn't know Brian Hyde. He drove all the way to Cedar and said, I'm just going to talk to this guy and he'll put me on, he'll put me on, and he did. And that's when he announced to the world that he was no longer going to need the services of the BLM. He had ridden with Cliven the year before, and uh, that's where he had begun some of his thinking about, well, hey, you know, this isn't quite right. Prior to prior to him doing that with the BLM, he had written a book um, through his uh, reading and learning. He was wondering, how can I make a difference? How can I uh, help others to understand how we are losing our freedoms and liberties 
in every walk of life, because it's not just about ranching. And so he wrote a book in story form and um, in reference to individual rights and liberties versus collectivism. There's a lot of information. I don't know how many of you read the book. Oh, wow, okay. So those who haven't, you'll, you'll really enjoy it. <laughs> um, so he wrote this book in hopes that it would teach and get people thinking and questioning where they were at in the process. I have a couple of reviews that I just want to share with you. Um, I hope this note finds you and the family in good health. And when I started reading LaVoy's book, I found it hard to get anything else done until I finished it. I was amazed at how intrigued he was able to keep his readers interested by the in by intertwining of fact and fiction. His ability to jump from a hero, so to speak, to being able to know the mind of a villain so visually described was a wonder in my mind. I don't ever remember reading a Louis L'Amour book that held my interest like this one did. And by the way, I had them all. How I wish I could have had that book in my father's library growing up, and I know he would have wanted it in his father's. I hope it isn't too late for me and my family of a combined 14 children, 21 grandchildren, and at last count, 25 great-grandchildren. Except for a few, most are pretty ignorant about what is being done to them in the grand scheme of things. Any information from mom or dad or grandparents is pretty much old-fashioned at this time in their lives. What I really appreciated in LaVoy's book was the way he addressed it to all ages, as though written to hold the attention for each generation, past, present, and those to come, which is why I would like to, he goes into wanting to get more books for his children. Um, the reason I picked that review is because that was the very reason LaVoy was writing the book. He wanted to help educate, he wanted to help teach, he wanted to get people's minds stirring, stirring about the liberties that we have lost, the choices that we're going to be faced with when it all breaks loose. Um, and so that was very touching. I wish he could have read that one. He would have been so thrilled. Another one says, loyalty, bravery, fortitude, family, freedom, and sacrifice are the key benchmarks of this incredible story. Lavoie Finnecum has created a well-written story that shows people for who we are based on what we believe, and more importantly, what we can become based on the decisions we make. The author masterfully demonstrates his incredible respect and honor for the freedoms this country was built on and that have become distorted and lost through the many generations of our ancestors. It is a revealing and prophetic glimpse of America's direction, and I will read it again. Again, I was really taken with those words, and I know that he would have been thrilled to have read some of these reviews on his book, because it is doing exactly what he wanted it to do. Um, before going to Oregon, he visited with quite a few ranchers, and actually, let me change that. He visited with ranchers all, in, all, all up to the time he left. He made all those videos um, that you see on YouTube and documenting his um, BLM issues and just things he wanted to talk about to the American people. Um, I really like the one title where he says, I'm dang, dang mad. <laughs> I thought that was kind of cute. Um, but when he was up in Oregon, he drove all night one time, one night with Ryan Bundy to get home and surprised me in the, at like 6 o'clock in the morning. And then he had um, speaking engagements. So he went to go see Brian Hyde again and did his last radio, appear, uh, radio appearance with Brian. Afterwards, we met with, again, a bunch of ranchers and um, citizens, um, the Sons of Liberty Group, and there was a gentleman named Jonathan Caldwell there. He was a chiropractor. And after listening to LaVoy, um, he, uh, a couple nights later, he had a dream. 
and he gets up at 4 o'clock in the morning to write down his dream. And he gave me the copy of that. I'd like to share it with you. I'm not a rancher, but I know many who are. I'm not a farmer, but I have family members in this county who are. I am the farthest thing from a cowboy, but I live in a community where most would identify with that name. You may ask, why then are you here? What can you possibly say to us, and how can you make any kind of difference? The answer is, I don't really know, 